Well, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our workshop today. Uh, we will get started because we have a lot of exciting and important content to cover. Uh, my name is Allison Hamilton. I'm based at the VA Greater Los Angeles and UCLA. And I am very, very happy uh, on behalf of the UCLA Rapid Rigorous Relevant Implementation Science Hub to uh, host this workshop and to welcome my dear colleagues and friends uh, who are gonna be walking us through the topic of implementation study designs to research health disparities. So this is one of several workshops that our hub has put on and part of a series that will continue on. So uh, please keep your eye out for upcoming sessions as well. Um, and all of our sessions are available on a YouTube channel um, that I'm pretty sure Elena will put in the chat uh, momentarily if I know her well. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna not take too much of our time. I just wanna do quick introductions of our panelists today. Uh, again, such a thrill and honor to have them with us and to have them as consultants for our NIMH funded hub. Um, so with us today, we have Dr. Anna Bauman, who is a research assistant professor at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. She is also the co-director of the Dissemination and Implementation Research Corps with the Institute of Clinical and Translational Science at WashU. Her research agenda focuses on the intersection of implementation science and healthcare disparities, specializing in strategies that facilitate the implementation of evidence-based interventions in low resource settings and for minority populations nationally and globally. Dr. Matt Chinman is a clinical and community psychologist and research scientist at the Vision for Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center at the VA Pittsburgh and a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation. He is also director of the Implementation and Evaluation Corps in the VA HSRD Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion at VA Pittsburgh. He has extensive experience, uh, research experience in developing and testing novel implementation strategies in the VA as well as community based care settings. And we also have Dr. Jeff Curran, who is a professor of pharmacy practice and psychiatry at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and director of the Center for Implementation Research at that same institution. His broad research area has been health services research with focus areas in predictors of treatment engagement and outcomes for mental health and substance use disorders and diffusion of innovation in a wide variety of healthcare settings. So it is my great honor to turn this over to this wonderful group of folks who uh, really did not even need an introduction uh, because of their the prominence of their work. Um, we're so happy to have you here and we're so appreciative that you have taken the time to develop um, this workshop and we can, we can get started. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, and thank you. This is, this is, I hope more of a conversation than a presentation. Um, we have put some slides together. They have not been audited for visual disabilities. If you need any audit um, slides or any PDF, email Elena and we'll make it happen. I do know that the visual uh, blurry background is also problematic for some people. If that is the case, just text us and we'll take the blur out of our backgrounds. This is just my new office. I moved, I'm not in the Brown School anymore. I'm, I'm in the med school. So I'm trying to make the office nice and cute. For now we are in the blurry state. Um, so next. When we talk about equity, I always like to start um, grounding the conversation from our perspective. Why is that important? It is important because the perspectives that we're bringing to this conversation are true only to the fact that we are presenting them. It might not be true for others from different backgrounds and different experiences in life. So I will start and then Jeff and, and, and Matt can um, follow through. So I am a Latina. I am born and raised in Brazil, uh, dual citizen, got citizenship in, in the United States. I am able-bodied, white skin, cisgender, colonizer, female in academia. 
Uh, so uh, Matt Timmon, white, US citizen, able-bodied, cisgender, white skin, male. Um, families originally from Germany and Russia escaping uh, Nazism and came over and came to Ellis Island, so. Hi, I'm Jeff Kern, uh, uh, white. Uh, I'm a dual US Irish citizen, uh, but born um, in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I am I am able-bodied uh, cis gender uh, with white skin and, and male. Thank you. And as such, our positionalities uh, bring us with experiences, but also several blind spots, right? And I just want to recognize that. I also want to recognize that it's at least to me uh, in, um, complex to talk about equity in, in the context of what's happening in the world, in, in policies and in, in, in wars and et cetera. And so I just wanna recognize what is happening outside and the privilege that it is to have this conversation with you all. Elena, next, thank you. So when we talk about equity, to me, it's really important to understand what is equity for you? So if you feel brave and if you feel safe, and hopefully this is a safe space, uh, just write on the chat. You can write it to just the host and panelists, or you can write it to everybody. What is equity for you? Why are you here? And what would equity look like in your research and your work? So do that, and we'll come back to those conversations. Uh, Elena, now we can go to the next one. <laughs> equity is different than equality, right? So inequality is you have a tree or you have a treatment and you have a hospital that's providing services to one population, but not to the other. Equality is me giving the same intervention, the same strategy to everyone, to every context and not adapting those. So for one, the little ladder helps get the apples. For the other one, it doesn't shift the needle. Equity is adjusting, adapting the intervention of the strategies for the context. Social justice would be providing interventions to any and everyone. So this is a classic classic slide, most probably, most of you have seen it. Uh, and then on next, please. And this is a slide that I made in January of this year when the government said, hey, we're in the middle of pandemic, I will send you COVID tests. Uh, and this is based on a Twitter by Ani uh, Blackstock, where to me, the differences between equality, equity, and social justice was very clear. So the government said, I'm gonna send you four or three tests to each household. And I don't, well, I haven't received those, but if you have, right, you went to the website and you, and you uploaded your, your address. Now, what does that mean? Equality means that my single friend will receive four tests. It also means that my friend who is married and has three kids and whose parents are leaving with her will also receive only four tests. So it's the same intervention to everyone, regardless of the context. Equity then would be tailoring the number of those, te those tests depending on the context. But here's the thing, my friend who is living in the park because he or she or they are homeless, if they don't have a certifiable address, they will not receive the test. So social justice then would mean everyone receiving the best quality of care just because they deserve, because we're part of the community, accessible to everyone. Next. So what would equity and implementation science then would look like and what does that mean? It means that several of us have been writing and publishing and asking ourselves, three, at least three questions, many, but at least three questions. One is, 
when you think through and when you develop your research interventions, who is involved in your studies, but most importantly, perhaps, who is absent and why? When you're selecting your interventions to implement, how are you selecting them? Why? And who is giving you the voice to say this is a fit for this context? What does that mean? Once interventions are selected, how do you then implement them? Are you doing equitable implementation strategies? And what does that mean? Next. Why is this important? It is important because if you can see, even the definition of implementation research of implementing evidence-based interventions in usual care can be perhaps maybe depending on how we do things, colonialist. Meaning, hey, there's this intervention, let me implement it in usual care. And what we've been asking, and several of us, there's a wealth of literature out there, is for us to think through how are interventions developed? How are they tested? What does that mean? And how are we implementing them? Next. So the how to develop interventions, how to engage community, there is a wealth of literature. We're not going to go through there. There's tons of papers, including uh, written by many of you who are here in, in the webinar. We're going to go very broad on one of them next. In thinking about how you can conceptualize your research questions. So, Jeff. Yeah. Um, so we we wanted to to focus on. Um, a common approach in our field to, to doing research studies. Um, uh, uh, you know, one, one um, uh, that is often called uh, effectiveness implementation hybrid designs, um, which is this notion of blending research components and research questions uh, from both clinical effectiveness and implementation research. Um, it is relatively common um, in our field for, for people in some way or another um, to try to study the effectiveness or impact of some intervention at the same time in some way to try to understand better implementation and context or indeed move into also um, developing and studying implementation strategies um, at the same time. Um, so as this is a this is a common approach in in going about doing research in our field, we thought it made sense to have a focus um, uh, you know on on um, on these approaches, which combine research questions about interventions and how best to deploy them. Um, also, just to make a point here too, that these um, hybrid approaches or hybrid designs um, are not um, pre-determining a certain research design or are not necessarily research designs in and of themselves. And so people apply a wide range of, of research or study designs in this hybrid context, even though they were originally um, pitched, if you will, as, as uh, trial designs with randomization happening somewhere. Um, so in our next slide, I will just give um, a really brief overview of these hybrid types, which we have proposed and uh, um, a lot of people use. And then Matt will take it from there to, to talk about how to approach um, integrating these kinds of um, study approaches in this um, effort. So next slide, please. Um, so, um, 
a, a while back now, um, we, um, we proposed um, three hybrid types or ideal types, um, which focused each a little bit differently on the blend of looking at the intervention and its effectiveness versus implementation strategies and their impact on delivering the intervention with adequate adoption reach um, fidelity. So hybrid type, hybrid type one studies um, lean largely more on intervention effectiveness. Um, many of these kinds of studies are um, randomized trials at a um, patient or person level um, and often have a secondary research question that has to deal with understanding implementation context, imp implementability of the intervention and how that might need to be made better um, for more wide scale implementation um, and understanding relative barriers facilitators to uptake. Flipping over to hybrid type three, um, that's more of a focus on learning about and testing implementation strategies, um, often in a comparative way, comparing implementation strategies and how well that they do in supporting implementation of the same intervention. Um, in our field, it's often very common now at the same time to try to study um, uh, the mechanisms of action of those strategies, meaning why are why and how are, are they working? And in this case, a secondary question is, is often, so in the context of implementation during the um, study, how is the intervention doing? Um, how is it, how is it performing in its duty, um, you know, to, to, to improve health. So having a secondary focus on those intervention outcomes. Um, and then there's the, um, hybrid type two, um, which is more of a, um, it's a more, more, equal look at trying to understand or test some intervention at the same time, which we are exploring or testing the, the impact of an implementation strategy or possibly even comparing strategies in possibly more of a dual randomized approach where the intervention effectiveness study might have a randomized component as well as the implementation um, side. So that's sort of a basic view here of the hybrid types. And then as Matt moves forward, he will help us to understand when and under which conditions um, in our efforts, we might want to lean more towards one, one or one or more of, more of these based upon how much you already know about intervention effectiveness and implementation context and early strategies. Matt. All right. Uh, um, thanks, Jeff and Anna. And so I think I'm just gonna talk for the next slide and then pass it back to Anna for a bit to talk about frameworks, but I will get to talking about the hybrids and and uh, and equity. Um, this is just a point that I, I, so when I first got to Pittsburgh in 2008 or nine, I forget now, I landed in a uh, an equity research shop trip. And um, I didn't know anything about equity at the time. And so, um, and so it just occurred to me that uh, implementation science has a real role to play in equity research. And talking to folks like Leslie Hausman and others uh, and, and Eva Woodward, um, we started to kind of put together this idea 
that um, you know, uh, a lack of equity is in some case a special case of implementation failure, right? So, and that implementation science and disparity research all has the same goal that, that patients get the best care for whatever that care is, for whatever need they have, they get the best care that, uh, that we have available to give them in all cases. And so, um, so that was just a point that kind of struck me and kind of got me into thinking about how equity and implementation, implementation science could interact. Um, and then the other piece that I was thinking about is that you know, given implementation science real focus on sort of the systems levels that it could really uh, play a nice role in sort of broadening the scope of studies that attempt to explain disparities, which I think tended at that time to kind of have a more individual focus on sort of kind of patients and providers. And so I, this is what, anyway, this is just some context and background for how uh, Jeff and Eva and Leslie and I kind of came to some of these ideas. But I think we're gonna turn it over to Anna and talk about frameworks for a bit. So um, we've, we've glanced through the designs. Ah, if you're implementation scientist or dissemination scientist, we've talked, we need to talk about the importance of frameworks, right? And why frameworks important? Because then you have constructs that you can examine the relationship between them, right? Among them. Ah, next. There are many challenges in the field. <laughs> Two of them are the fact that in several of our frameworks, um, equity, issues of equity, social determinants of health, racism, and discrimination are not explicitly defined. And when you don't have something that is explicitly defined or embedded in the framework, it's really hard to then address, measure, examine, right? So one of the things that several of us have been trying to bring is the wealth of literature from our community participatory research, which is researchers from our health equity uh, scholars, partners, to bring that literature to implementation science so we can then learn and co-create and collaborate, including examining our frameworks. Next. Several of us have put some frameworks uh, up there. They're process frameworks, they're, they're evaluation frameworks, there are many frameworks. Um, if you need more frameworks, happy to send you frameworks. <laughs> so we're gonna just talk about just one today as an example of how to explicitly uh, uh, embed equity in an implementation science framework. Next. So um, uh, Marshall Chin's uh, roadmap is like really is really instructive uh, here. Um, when we were putting together this paper and these ideas, um, this was sort of uh, essential reading, I think, uh, and especially the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation project reviews on multiple projects that were in the 2000s that were trying to uh, get at equity. And what uh, Chin sort of uh, posits here is just a, a very nice roadmap for how to tackle disparities, sort of recognizing them, doing quality improvements, and then designing a disparity reducing intervention. So needing to understand that disparity, making sure that you consider multiple levels, looking at the literature, talking to peers, and then trying to stick to the evidence base as best as possible, implement and evaluate and then and sustain. And so I think um, this is maybe not as novel now, uh, given where we are in 2022, but just having uh, what sort of spoke to me about this was just the explicit focus of, of the dispar you know, focusing on disparity in and of themselves, I think was a big deal um, coming out of uh, Chin's work. And that if, you're, if you don't have it woven into what you're doing, whether you're a healthcare organization or a research organization, then it just goes by the wayside because of all our sort of privilege biases, you know, we all will tend to go towards, you know, just the, the usual, but with a specific focus that Chin talks about, I think is when you begin to see things uh, changing. Next slide. Um, so this is uh, the Health Disparities Research Framework um, by 
uh, Kilborn, uh, Amy Kilborn et al., and other folks um, at uh, the Pittsburgh uh, CHIRP, uh, Center for Health Equity Research and Promotion. Um, so this has been around for a, a while now, and it's been pretty useful uh, way to conceptualize um, doing research on disparities. So starting with phase one, needing to de obviously detect this disparities, kind of understand um, that it exists. So trying to define vulnerable populations and measuring it. A lot of times you see big data um, uh, approaches ferreting out these, uh, these disparities. Um, and then that leads to phase two, which is really understanding the determinants of what is driving the disparity. And so this is supposed to be done at multiple levels. So from patients and providers, the clinical encounter and healthcare system. But I think what um, I'll talk about is that a lot of times, at least in the early goes of uh, this work, a lot of it tended to be focused on patients and sometimes providers. And so what that then led to in phase three, when you're supposed to be intervening uh, in the disparity is that, you know, the way you conceptualize something obviously has a big effect on how you then intervene on it. So if your lens is only at the patient level, then a lot of times these, uh, these equity prom promoting interventions are only going to be at the patient level. And we know that from implementation science and many other fields that, you know, we need to be looking across all ecological levels because um, they have a big role uh, to play. So, and sometimes it's not necessarily um, a, a direct bias that might be at play. So for example, say, you know, you have an organization, a big healthcare organization. One of the things that, you know, folks at CHIRP have been talking about and coming up with dashboards to measure is, um, you know, various different measures at systems levels to kind of document the existing the existence of a disparity. And so, if you don't have sort of mechanisms and structures in place to document that, then you're not going to know about it and know enough to uh, intervene. So the abs sometimes just the absence of a structure, like a, a consistent data collection focus on existence of disparities in a healthcare system, can continue to promote uh, that disparity. And and maybe maybe unwittingly, you know, uh, that would be a, maybe a generous uh, interpretation, um, but. Um, so that just pays to look at, at, at multiple levels because could there, there could be things happening that you don't even know about and so that would take into account. Um, my son just got home, so that's the door slamming in the background. Um, so uh, next slide. So I think that that's, this circle here is just to show that um, a lot of the emphasis was originally placed on phase one uh, in phase two, there was a lot of early studies um, and Chin did a, uh, and others did a bunch of reviews um, of all these different equity uh, attacking studies and just found that most were uh, phase one and phase two and very little was done in phase three. And then even in phase three itself, when this model was initially created, uh, this you know implementation was just a glint in Jeff Kern's eyes. It was basically not even a thing hardly then. I think actually the first issue of Implementation Science came out, I think in 2006, I believe. Um, so it was, uh, it was really an afterthought and it was mostly just thought of as like, you know, dissemination. And so we've obviously evolved way more now. And so we know that much more needs to be done. So, so this model is a good start, but we need to, I think, uh, you know, it needs to be expanded. Next slide. So, um, so this is just a, a look at CIFR. Uh, the, I guess I should say now the old CIFR. This is how old we're getting. There's the, uh, the new CIFR um, 2.0. But um, so this is uh, you know the consolidated framework for implementation research. The, uh, Dam Schroeder and her group um, putting together um, sort of a very comprehensive list pulled from multiple literatures of all the different factors that could be involved that influence uh, both negatively and positively implementation. Um, for, I mean, sorry, five major domains, uh, the clinical practice characteristics, the inner setting, that's about the organization, the outer setting, which is the greater context, 
individual providers and then the implementation process. So as we were putting this paper together, we tended to notice that, uh, next slide, that most of the factors that were being talked about were highlighted in red. They were things that had to do with individual provider characteristics, but that left out a lot of characteristics at all different levels. And so the idea here is that, that implementation science could bring uh, a, broader, a broader lens to when considering all the different factors that could be influencing a disparity. Next slide. So uh, CIFR has continued to evolve. Um, the, this uh, addendum uh, effort by Dam Schroeder et, et al. was to kind of think about different types of outcomes that um, would be useful to um, evaluate uh, after they came out with their initial, um, initial piece. Um, also, um, uh, Michelle Allen at the University of Minnesota um, also has uh, another version of CIFR that specifically targets racism and, and structural racism, which is a, a nice, useful uh, sort of tweak on the sort of the classic CIFR as a way to, to get more grounded in um, equity. So there's, I think, a lot of different now versions that are available that focus specifically uh, on equity and disparities. Next slide. So here is, uh, we get to the, this heuristic that we developed uh, that, come as, as Jeff was saying, combines um, the hybrid models, the hybrid research designs, which are, you know, solidly, you know, implement, uh, implementation and, um, and equity and a focus on equity within research. And so uh, we thought that, okay, you start with, um, evidence for a clinical intervention or a problem. And so this is also embedded within the traditional of uh, those three phases that I mentioned previously. So this is after you've detected that there is in fact a disparity. So that would be phase one. Now we're in phase two, where we wanna try to understand it. And then we'll be moving into phase three. But while we're in phase two, so you gotta ask yourself, is there evidence for a clinical intervention for the problem? Um, if, if the answer is no, then you actually got to go and test that clinical intervention, that underlying uh, clinical intervention. If there is evidence, then the question is, well, is there evidence for this clinical intervention across multiple vulnerable groups? So that's where we, we're starting to get into the, the disparities. Um, so if the answer is no, then that gets you into a hybrid one. So you want to conduct research with a vulnerable, you know, in the with a vulnerable population, exploring that full range of implementation factors that, say, a CIFR uh, would provide. Um, so that's you know that kind of routes you to a hybrid one design that Jeff was talking about. If the answer to that question is yes, then are the factors known why the intervention is not being delivered and received equally across groups? So. And if, the, if you don't know that, the answer is no there, then we, we talk about, well, maybe sort of a, uh, the, the process evaluation or formative evaluation part of a hybrid one would be a good option to kind of explore the full range of implementation factors within those vulnerable populations. Because you, you gotta be grounded in all those kind of barriers with that population before diving into trying to do something about it. Um, so we route you to a, sort of the process or formative evaluation of a hybrid one. And I would just note there. Go, yeah, that, go ahead, Joe. You know, you know, just that, you know, that can be a freestanding study on its own. Yes, that's, um, yes. Um, or it certainly could be, depending upon the nature of the funding mechanism and an early study aim starting to lean into a hybrid type two study where you might be wanting to develop and possibly pilot test and implementation strategy, which might result from this kind of um, eval evaluation of this sort of implementation factors and context. Excellent point. Excellent point. Thank you, Jeff. Um, 
So then if you feel like um, you do have a sense of what the factors are um, for this population, for this um, problem, for this intervention, then you could be ready to test an implementation strategy as Jeff is, is saying um, in that, in the, with those vulnerable groups. Next slide. So this then depends on how developed the evidence is for the clinical intervention across the vulnerable population that you're talking about. And so these are, I think, generalities. And so they're, it's hard to apply this to every single situation, but in general. Um, so if, the, if there's some evidence and the clinical intervention needs more testing in the real world and, a, and and you also need a test of an implementation strategy to support it, then a hybrid two could be a good option there where you really get that dual focus between implementation strategy and clinical intervention. If there's stronger evidence, but maybe not indisputable, um, the clinical intervention needs most, mostly a test of an implementation strategy to support it. And you have some outcome evaluation data that maybe that's easy to get, um, then you could be talking about a hybrid three, that would be a good option. And then if there's really, really conclusive evidence, really strong, and then the only thing we really need to know is, do they just, you know, do they get it or not? You know, do they, um, that's really all. Then we're talking about really just a pure implementation trial, and you might not even need to collect outcome data because we know, like the, the evidence showing that the delivery of the intervention is so closely associated with an outcome that all we really need to measure is the implementation. Um, so it gets you into this sort of uh, a range of options based on how developed uh, that evidence is in that vulnerable population that you're, con that you're considering. Next slide. So uh, we have like, there's a number of examples that we provide in this paper and we try to give examples across the four different um, options here. Uh, I, I won't definitely go through all of them, but for example, um, with uh, obstructive, obstructive, it's hard to say, sleep apnea or OSA, um, African-Americans tend to uh, have it more, but then get screened less. Um, and so, the screening is clearly an evidence-based practice. It should be done. Um, and, but it, the implementation factors were not exactly known in terms of why we're seeing that uh, disparity. And so there was some effort to try to do some formative evaluation um, around this. And it was interesting in reviewing some of the papers for this, um, some of the things that were focused on in some of this early work were things that, um, we're not really, not sort of grounded in, in culture. And yet some of the, sometimes the authors would make sort of offhand comments in the discussion about, well, we noticed that, you know, um, screening was better when, you know, there were um, providers that were more grounded in the, and it, it was sort of, it was just fascinating because it was mentioned as sort of an offhand way. And I'm thinking, no, that's really, that's the, some of the secret sauce there. Like that should be part of, the, um, the, the process evaluation, that's, those are the things we should be asking about because they are powerful, they do tend to uh, have a big effect and they shouldn't be sort of relegated to um, kind of pontificating in the discussion section. Um, so, um, and then sort of all the way on the other side is um, at a, for a pure trial, uh, this was uh, for total knee replacement among those with advanced osteoarthritis. Um, and again, there is a disparity here. African-Americans tend to, who have advanced osteoarthritis tend to get TKR less. And so this was, um, and so th this was an, an effort to try to think about, well, how can we design implementation strategies? Because we know if you get TKR and if you have advanced osteoarthritis, you're going to have good outcomes. And so we know, we definitely know that. So it's just how could we get TKR to happen more? And so we give examples of how you could create different groups um, of implementation strategies comparing um, you know, ones that are more culturally grounded to, you know, to kind of highlight and show that those in fact are needed components to make this 
um, actually work. Next slide. So um, in thinking about the, the health disparities research framework, which was sort of, you know, that older phase one, phase two, phase three, sort of a, a classic, uh, and then combining it with more of a, a more recent implementation framework called uh, iParis. Um, so this is out of Eva, um, Eva Woodward at all work. And they basically combine these two together to try to create a new uh, health disparities framework. So Paris is really helpful in that you know it conceptualizes uh, the implementation of innovations you know via some key factors around the context, around the innovation, and then around the recipient. And it also hypothesizes that is that you really can't get really good implementation unless there's some facilitation of some kind, basically someone helping somewhere somehow. Um, and so in putting those, these two models together, we get um, the next slide. <laughs> uh, the health equity implementation framework. And we were just saying earlier that we, none of us know how to pronounce the acronym. I don't know if Eva, is on, it might be on the call if she is. Uh, Heath, 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 it's uh, take your pick. Um, but the idea here is you take a lot of uh, the factors that you would go after in uh, iParis at the context um, and the recipient um, levels, and you basically tweak them to make them have a specific equity focus. Um, so they're also really, um, they stress, uh, in addition to multiple ecological levels, they also very much point out how important the clinical encounter is. So we are sort of rooted in healthcare here. And there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the actual clinical encounter that is rife uh, um, for uh, biases to occur and where uh, basically the lack of equity starts. So they have a, a specific focus on that. And then um, every determinant, um, there's a sort of a societal influence on and that, and so there's a heavy emphasis on that there. Um, and also expanding recipient factors to include specific uh, determinants specific to health equity is a major factor here. And then you add facilitation and in order to get successful implementation and improvements in health equity. Um, so this is, I think, one framework that, again, there are many that could be uh, really helpful. And um, in putting you know, grants together and projects together, you know, we have found this helpful to guide sort of um, all phases. So from the, you know, uh, determinants, sort of I'm trying to understand uh, what's going on with, um, to targeting different factors about how to improve it and all the way through measures of, uh, you know, in your research designs to try to see, it, you know, what impacts that you had. It's sort of, you could sort of thread this on all the way through. Um, so I think, um, this is, I believe, the end of our slide. So I think we have a, a good amount of time to uh, take questions, which it looks like uh, Elena just said there are many questions or some questions. So do we wanna read them out or how do we wanna do, or should people raise their hands? There are already some really interesting points and questions. I don't know, Elena, if we can uh, stop sharing the slides so we can see each other. Um, I I wanted to to recognize Muriel, uh, Christopher, and of course I don't know if I don't know if people can say if they can um, correct our ways of saying their names. Uh, talked about how when we asked what is equity for you, um, talked about the importance of distinguishing there's equity as an outcome, right? So decreasing disparities or providing interventions for everyone uh, accordingly, adapting the interventions to the context, but also process. And I just want to uh, leverage that in terms of perhaps the most important piece and aspect of equity is our reflection, is the process, uh, internal process, uh, research team, 
in society as as we think through our biases and the way that we uh, act in the world. I don't know if there are more uh, reflections on what equity might look like and how equity and implementation science, uh, what an implementation science with an equity lens is perhaps different or similar to what we traditionally con conceive. Um, Mirella, and I'm asking you this to you both, Mirella asked a question in terms of how do the provider's position, positionalities and background, how could that affect uh, the phase three of research? And what do we do about that? That is, the last is my question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know if there's an easy, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. I, I think, um, you know, everyone comes to these things with, with biases. And I think, um, you know, I really appreciated the, you know, the earlier slides that get people to reflect on their own, uh, uh, their own aspects about this and what they bring to it, I think is really important. Um, and, you know, making people aware of, you know, who they, you know, things about them influence their work. And, and you know, the first step is obviously uh, being aware of that. So you can hopefully build a team and, and a group that has knowledge about that. So to kind of keep these kind of things from unduly influencing the work. And I wanna recognize that those, we, we do it, right? So. Uh, Several of you might have heard my example. Um, I, I am a parent interventionist and I'm very passionate about the work that I do. And at one point of time, I'm, I'm talking about the work that I do in terms of parent interventionist and a transgender woman stopped me and said, hold your horses or anything, right? Because a lot of the work that we do in terms of family life balance and parent interventions are coming from a cisgender approach. And this person did not feel welcomed in those spaces. And so that is one of my biases. And that is one of the, that to me was one of the wake up calls. And so to me, to, to the point about equity being a reflection and how positionality matters, right? Ah, now I need to think through how I position myself, who I can collaborate with. So then I can address that bias and that blind spot. Um, so then those interventions can be delivered to everyone, caregivers in non-binomial uh, cisgender perspective. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of conversation happening in the chat. Uh, two other questions. One, uh, Laurie asked about what to do with RCTs when we have to not adapt interventions. When we, when we what, say that again? Lori, I'm trying, You, ha I had your question right there and then now, now conversations are happening. I don't know if you can. Oh, I, yeah, but uh, constrain us to do the same thing for yes. everyone. Well, I mean, there are, there are different trial designs where you, you know, like smart trial designs and others where you adapted designs where you don't have to actually necessarily do the same thing for everyone. Um, so there, there are some ways to kind of get around that. Um, and also, I mean, as I've gotten older and balder, I've uh, gotten the way to thinking about, you know, trying to make sure the intervention as delivered is the best it can be for everyone who's there. And if that, sometimes means tweaking things along the way. I, I, think it's, I think it's fair to do. The best thing to do is really to document it, maybe with something like frame or some other approach to just make sure that you're really well documenting the changes that you do make. But I think, um, you know, just like any intervention, 
taken up by any provider, you know, might be tweaked on the fly because that provider might say, I think I need to make certain changes to get a better outcome for my, my patients. I think it can be fair to do that to some extent in RCTs. But. Yeah, I would say that that is something that happens more often in those kinds of grants than are commonly talked about in, in, in the studies. Because as we all know that there are, there are times when we are trying to do these kinds of studies and we're struggling to sort of get, you know, the ad ad adequate numbers in those studies, we're struggling with fidelity or outcomes or not, not exactly where things are. And that does indeed happen, um, but it is often not talked about as, as much as it probably should. I also just wanted to to, to make a related comment, you know, one of the common starting points for some of these hybrid type two studies is this notion that, well, we have some effectiveness data of some intervention, but it might not be in the population or context which we have interest in. And so one might not necessarily need to start from scratch with a brand new, new RCT or even a hybrid type one um, but we might want to um, make some adaptation um, to that intervention, have a new clinical trial of it, whether that's a randomized study or, or, or not, but try to move forward with, you know, doing some of that formative work about what might, you know, be some of the implementation strategies which we might need to um, use with a new population and or a new context. And so a hybrid type two is a, is a nice um, landing spot, if you will, in that con, you know, in, in that situation, you know, where you are wanting to take some intervention out of where it's been studied before. It has good evidence maybe from other populations or context, but we wanna change that, adapt it, while also trying to, to learn faster about what kinds of implementation strategies we might need in the real world. And the argument goes is, well, a hybrid type two is a nice place for that because we have some evidence of this kind of thing working in some other areas. We want to adapt it so we can kind of use that, that evidence to try to move forward in the, the translational focus to try to focus more on strategies to learn about how, how, how well the intervention might be doing certainly as a still a key and a main focus in a new population or, or a new context, but while trying to learn more about strategies and speed that translation process. Awesome. And I think that by, by through that explanation, you might have answered a couple of the questions, but I think there is one question that Richard posed that I think it's really important. Um, the question says, your most recent model put the clinical encounter at the center. Since, as you know, so much mm -hmm. of the health and therefore health equity occurs outside the clinical encounter, how would you modify the framework to take more of the health determinants into account? So I did probably a terrible job at talking about this framework <laughs> since it's, I mean, it's not my framework, but I do like it. Um, so it, I mean, the, the, the framework does actually have, um, it, it does focus on all different ecological levels. And so not just the clinical encounter, I think, um, you know, sometimes the pendulum swings back and forth on some of these things. And I think, Eva and the group were just a little bit reacting to how systems focused, everything was uh, you know, being constructed and just wanted to say, hey, you know, the clinical encounter also matters too, but that doesn't uh, mean that you, we shouldn't focus on um, you know, health, uh, you know, determinant, health determinants, societal influence, like all of that. So, it's meant to actually try to hit all of those different pieces. But that is a great point. Uh, 
Yeah. And so I just posted, um, I have so many tags now. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Eva has a new paper talking about the more practical guide. And in there, I think the policy is part of it. CIFR, the new CIFR 2.0 has policy. And I think to your point, um, Richard, we, we haven't done a really good job in, in having that relationship of policy to our intervention, right? Which makes a lot of sense. You might have the best of the best drug to treat whatever disease, but if you don't have insurance, what's the point of that, right? So we need to do, I think, more work as implementation scientists with the policy and vice versa so we can um, provide. That. Yeah, um, as a follow-up point to the first question and also your comments on it. I mean, I think that for a while, and, and, I, and I think it might just come from where some of a lot of us who were, you know, around um, at the start of this field. I mean, I do think that we came to this with a clinical effectiveness and healthcare system kind of focus and, and bias. You know, and I have certainly learned, you know, watching people apply these hybrid approaches to other kinds of interventions, which are, you know, not in, in a clinical setting. You know, that some of these assumptions that we make about clinic, clinical uh, interventions and contexts and this sort of efficacy to effectiveness to implementation pipeline doesn't really always work. And, lots of other kinds of fields where people are trying to apply implementation science also. Um, public, public health research, health behavior interventions, policy research, you know. So, I mean, I think us as a field, we, we do have to deal with, and I think that we're starting to try to not just always focus on clinical interventions and providers and that, sort of interaction because as these folks are really right, there's so much more going on. Um, I mean, I think, you know, just for, for me, me personally, I've been focusing for a long, long time on clinical settings and on strategies that are focused on providers and settings to, you know, focus more on this delivery of care and quality of care. Um, and even when I started to, to, to think about equity and trying to, to make gains there, just because of where I come from and where I've always studied, I started to focus on those areas too, on clinical decision supports and nudges and other things to try to you know, work with clinician behavior. But that's clearly not the only place where we can and, can and do do this work. But there are times when our field kind of starts 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 there or has a bit of bit of a bias there and and this kind of work is happening in lots of other places and there are so many other intervention points that are not just in you know that rather narrow sphere i i think yeah i i i'm picking up on that i think it's so true in that you know a lot of times so I, I've done over the years a lot of work with community coalitions mm -hmm. who, you know, who have typically they go after broader policy kind of changes and, you know, things that are hard to necessarily document in a clinical trial, right? If, you know, you make one policy change, you know, what does that mean statistically? But it could have a huge impact, you know, whether you're talking about um, sort of open green space for, you know, uh, people to have room to exercise, um, you know, and so, you know, these decisions are really important and um, sometimes might not fit within the perfect clinical trial, you know, a statistical analysis framework that we have. So there was a question, uh, Joanne Eliason. Hi, Joanne, how are you doing? Um, and so uh, curious on how one might assess a site's readiness to embrace health equity oriented research and how to facilitate implementation of health equity interventions? That's a great, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so I know, um, 
and this isn't quite getting at that, but so Larry Green uh, developed a, a set of guidelines for community-based participatory research, um, which, you know, overlaps, I think, with some of this stuff um, in terms of involvement of stakeholders. Um, so he has a really a nice set of criteria where um, you can kind of rate yourself or rate others on how well an effort is um, going on. But I think maybe something like that could be adapted to uh, basically kind of take the temperature of a place to see how well they could do health equity oriented research. I wonder about anyone else on the, in the audience or others have thoughts be interested to. Sorry, I was placing tons of names. <laughs> mm -hmm. I cannot write and talk at the same time. <laughs> um, so instead of putting papers, I'm adding names of people that I know work in that space and have done a lot of a lot of work. Uh, again, there's there's a wealth of literature out there. Uh, we most of the time just need to sit down, listen, and learn. Um, I'll I'll look for the Larry Green site. Yeah. Greg is like, mm, just give me the name and the citation. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, there is a, a question around hybrid designs, which is also something that I, I also get, uh, Jeff, and if you can address. It says, um, I appreciate Dr. Curran's messaging about hybrid two trials for interventions that have already have effectiveness that data for the broader population, not specific to certain subgroups example, racial ethnic minorities. However, I have received feedback that proposed interventions need subgroup specific eff effectiveness data and that implementation study might be premature. I feel this mindset might further delay intervention implementation among minority populations. Thoughts? What do we do with subgroup analysis? <laughs> It's an interesting question. I mean, I, I mean, I think that, I mean, I think, you know, I've seen people do this kind of work where the focus of the new study in the hybrid type two context is on specifically the new context or, or new population. So is the comment then about the makeup of the um, overall sample or comparison groups? I'm not exactly sure I'm, I'm following the question if, if Matt or Anna could possibly help there. I was looking for Larry Green's uh, citation. I didn't hear the question. <laughs> um, Does anyone want to jump in? There's a lot of, uh, um, Elena, I don't know if we can share the chat later with everybody. There's a lot of, a lot of conversation happening and sites happening and, and resources sharing happening over there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I wrote in the chat that I'm happy to send out all the citations that are being shared in the chat and the follow up email after the session. So no worries. I know folks might be furiously writing those down, but yeah, I, uh, we'll I mean, send a list of this. I just found the comment, you know, and at the end, it says that they feel that that this mindset might further delay intervention implementation among minority populations. I mean, I, I mean, I do think that it is relatively common for people, you know, working in the, you know, this hybrid approach for, for, for people, you know, to get some pushback, um, you know, of going too fast um, to trying to get to test implementation and strategies and that you know hybrid type twos might be too bold and you know don't 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 you still need to do these larger um implementation uh, sorry 
you know, do more effectiveness trials with, you know, larger populations. Yeah, sure. You know, adding in different groups, but, you know, let's not move forward and, you know, on implementation strategies until we, you know, do more trials comparing groups X or Y or Z, you know, I got into this field and I, I was attracted to this field because I wanted to go faster. And I was attracted to this notion of hybrid designs, you know, hope, you know, hoping that people will be comfortable with seeing some evidence that might have, you know, shown things as, as a concept being effective in certain populations and certain certain contexts, making adaptations which we think makes sense using, you know, multiple partner co-creation to make those changes. And then to not just do another effectiveness trial where we're not focusing on implementation issues, but move it into to the space based upon the confidence perhaps of these mechanisms of actions of interventions which seem to you know to look good to still look at new effectiveness data in in new populations or places but while also trying to move into studying strategies to try to speed up um, but I do understand that people getting reviews do sometimes get pushback like hey hold up a minute hold up don't look at implementation and strategies yet until you show in, you know, some definitive trial that this still works with new population X, Y, or Z. This whole hybrid approach was trying to speed stuff up and, you know, and hopefully as these things get more and more normal, maybe less of, of these roadblocks will will be put into place. But I know that it does happen. You know, it's, it's funny, Jeff, you talk about like going, you know, wanting to go faster on, the, on that sort of the effectiveness trial side. I mean, the place that I feel like it would be nice to maybe slow down a little bit is on the initial understanding all the determinants part, because I think, Sometimes people rush because I think a lot of times review committees want to see interventions. And so there is not as much time taken to really get grounded in a community and in culture. And, and we just make assumptions based on biases. So if, it was, if there was anywhere in the pipeline that I'd like to see maybe it slow down a little bit would be that way earlier part and then do all the hybrids to go faster. It's, I think it'd okay. be nice. Yeah. Okay. One more question. I just want to say uh, um, the reference for a paper that I love and adore to your point, Matt, in terms of, of learning and how to learn and how to check for our power and privilege and our positionalities and learning about the context. Uh, this is a paper that I, I don't know how many times I've read. <laughs> <laughs> and I send it to everyone because I think it's a powerful uh, read. Um, Guys, now wrote in, in our own Allison. Anything that Allison writes, by the way, just just, just read. It cannot go wrong. No. <laughs> Any, uh, I also want to recognize that there is a conversation around um, <laughs> policy and and the right what to do when you know when our patients are deciding whether to buy the medication versus buying food right or housing and there are some studies showing that if we tackle social determinants of health we improve things like mental health right so one of the things that some of us have started to argue is that maybe i don't know the field of implementation science is thinking too much of the short outcomes, right? So improve mental health, A or B. Maybe one way to go if we're thinking about sustainability is actually let's give housing or employment to people. 
So if you have employment and you have money to buy food and you have a house, then supposedly you're happy, right? So maybe we're going things around and maybe there's a space for us to think different ways and how we are thinking through addressing quality of gap if you were to do in, in a, through a social justice lens. Yeah, and I think that's when, you know, like good old fashioned mental health, like the recovery, sort of the recovery movement, you know, talks about that in terms of you don't, like you don't necessarily have to just tamp down your symptoms in order then to start living a life, but it's like doing all the things that everyone likes to enjoy and sort of work, love and play um, is actually good for your mental health. And so having all those factors is important. So I think, I think the recovery, which, you know, was again, groundbreaking 30 years ago and now has been around for a while. And, but I think it, hit on some of those things. What else? I Okay, suddenly there's lots of, sometimes it feels like the, the tools in DNI research are not able to encompass the systems in this complex entirety. Yes. Ah, we're learning. <laughs> <laughs> we have a lot to learn from our health disparities and from our, you know, employment researchers, from our housing researchers, collaborators that we haven't traditionally, I think, to your point, Jack. So one of the things that I that I also think it's important for us to frame is how recent is the field of implementation science, right? So we are we're complaining about the field, but you know we're in the teenagers. We've learned a lot, but we have still a lot to learn, right? So think about Anola Proctor's CIFRS 2009 2010 papers. So we're talking about ten ish years. Uh, so he's right, just, just position our critiques, a lot of them in the context of our history. I think it's important. Um, what are the questions? Uh, David, uh, David Goodrich um, uh, from our shop um, had a, a question or a sort of a statement comment. Um, does not seem like business organizations are held up by limitations, quote, in market analysis and type three trials. It seems like we can use newer monitoring strategies to understand context variability to meet needs of specific populations not included in the original trials. Good point. Um, it would help with interventions that clearly define core elements, functions, including basic playbook for implementation, understanding that cultural and local context tailoring is necessary. Um, this might be a combination of a need for new methods and analysis to understand variability across large scale implementation effort, efforts, question mark. This might be easier in large healthcare systems. I mean, I think, I mean, I think, you know, uh, specifying core elements and functions is always a good idea in, in any context. Um, but I think, yeah, the, and the more specified they are, then I think the easier it would be to tailor them for different cultures and communities. So I think, you know, sometimes just good old fashioned, you know, practice can be helpful for a lot of different reasons. So I totally agree. Thanks, David. Yeah. yeah. Excellent point. But to do that, so I, I can't not, not talk about adaptation, right? So to do that, you've got to track what you're adapting. And to do that, you have to have methods, process, and ways, right? So, so the science of adaptation, I think, has evolved from never adapt to, okay, now we adapt, so now we're going to figure out how to adapt, and now we figure out how to track those adaptations, right? So I think even the science of adaptations has moved, and the dream that we have is to build the adapt <laughs> right? So you have an intervention being developed, implemented in different settings for different populations. If you track the adaptations that you're doing, for the interventions yeah. and for the strategies, that's when you get to the core components, right? But we are not tracking, we're not verbalizing those things, we're not publishing those things. So so that's our call to each one of you to do that yeah. so we can get to And there goals. are certainly times with interventions and certainly still now with a lot of strategies where we don't really know what those core components and functions are. And so, you know, some of the evidence-based practices which we you know deal with or in some healthcare systems you know when we are called to to 
deploy them widely, some of this stuff might not actually even be known yet. So in some of the work that we are doing around adapting, we're actually playing catch up um, with some of those, you know, core functions and core elements of interventions. And, you know, certainly in implementation science, you know, in some of the lots of the early work that we did in the VA around testing implementation strategies, we were not looking at mechanisms, certainly not quantitatively of those. So even, you know, having a better understanding of those factors for implementation strategies is certainly needed as we desperately want to try to apply them and compare them across intervention and, and context. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot to do in our young field. And in some ways we're playing catch up, um, you know, to some things that, you know, really weren't done very, very well that became established. Um, and now we're trying to chase that, you know, chase some of that stuff. And I also think we, we've repli you know, so we replicated some of the problems that plagues clinical research. Absolutely. Implementation research. I mean, it's, you know, it shouldn't surprise anyone that we've done some of the same things. And I agree about the catch up piece too. Yeah. Rod. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we need resurgent, right? So it's the inequities of being here forever. We just need to rethink, I think. Uh, I wanna um, point to a paper that I also really like. I apparently I'm passionate about papers, but um, <laughs> Philippi, and I'm saying this with Latino accent, so I don't know if that's true. You talk about strategies uh, for like health disparities strategies. There, today, this is how I think, and it might change tomorrow. Okay, and I hope that if if you disagree, that we you, we can have this conversation. Today, this is how I think. There are some strategies in the classic Eric, right? The compilation strategies, which is a list. Eric is just a bunch of lists, let's put it this way, of strategies that are uh, context clean, let's put it this way, right? So there's none around uh, it, it, learning about culture or advocacy or against anti right uh, allyship anti discrimination etc there is a whole again there's a whole list of things out there that we need to bring to implementation science so that's one answer to your question the other way and or the other way to think through is that any of the strategies in the eric compilation strategies could be an equity strategy or not right so let's play with education. We all increase increasing knowledge, right? We all do it because you got to increase knowledge on something that you're implementing. And education, thank mm -hmm. you, Elena. <laughs> education can be increasing inequities or not, depending on how the, you do the form or the function, right? So uh, I this paper um, that Larissa Gaia has published around a framework to help us think through what are the explicit explicit assumptions of our strategies i think is one paper that could help us think through select any of those strategies from eric and then sit down and think through who is doing what when how and how are those strategies increasing or not equity so that's how i conceptualize the work right now maybe tomorrow if you ask that question i might change but that's that's where i am And I, in some ways, I also think the challenging certain assumptions about, um, I think, you know, ethnic minorities and low income, because um, I, so I, I've done a little bit of work in homelessness, and it used to be, it used to be thought that you couldn't give, you know, people who are homeless or have addictions, you couldn't give them money for housing because they'll just spend it on drugs, which is totally not true and but it took research to actually show um and this was a, a bunch some of this was done in the VA and um uh and so once that was shown to be not true 
then that allowed other strategies to be used. Like, like just, you know, if, if you give people money and provide them with housing, if they're homeless, uh, that's a huge way to get them to uh, thrive in all sorts of other areas because it's really hard, you know, folks know Maslow's like hierarchy of needs. And so, um, so I think sometimes, you know, directly challenging these, these, uh, these biases is, can be a way to go as well. And it's, it's dispiriting and sad sometimes that it takes uh, research studies to show that, you know, just giving people money who need it can be helpful, but sometimes that is needed. Hold on, Richard, because I think we're all reading your journal. <laughs> 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 How do you think about adjusting frameworks if the patients have widely different notions of health? Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think we do. <laughs> so I'm going to find, yeah, I'm going to find the link. Um, there is a webinar that, um, we we did with researchers from different backgrounds and i asked them what does equity look like and what does social justice look like for you and the answers were in some ways similar but in others very different ah and so part of you know the papers that we've been publishing right that we've been talking about part of examining the assumptions is that you need to listen to your community because health might have very different connotations depending on who you work with. Uh, and so that's part of the equity work, right? Is, is really, it's not just asking, it's actually listening uh, and, and, and having that conversation with the community. Yeah, you know, and, and I, you know, it's probably really challenging for, uh, you know, a, like a, a health system in a community to maybe be nimble enough to uh, be able to, you know, equitably provide health care to, all, you know, many different kinds of folks, but that is the goal. And so if we are truly trying to promote equity, it would be that they could do that, so. They're <laughs> all Yes, yes, that is true. I could be. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, to Matt's point earlier, right? Uh, that is where we need to spend the time. That is where we need to really examine the history, the context, the assumptions. The, power and privilege. Um, we, I don't, Elena, five, Allison, I don't know. We have but five more minutes and so happy to take more questions or. Uh, so, yes, so I think we're all sitting and nodding at the chat. So <laughs> there's such <laughs> great stuff going and I know that there are some questions that we haven't even gotten to yet. I thank you all so much for in the audience for these amazing contributions and on uh, your encyclopedic knowledge of this literature is <laughs> it all at your fingertips, which is amazing. Um, that's, uh, this is gonna be a big resource for folks. And so as Elena said, we'll be sure to um, send that information along with the other information you may need uh, for the workshop um, and accessing it uh, later on. Um, I don't want it to stop, but I know folks have other things to move on to and we just have a few moments left. Uh, so I wanna make sure that our panelists have a chance to acknowledge their funding sources, um, which are plentiful. Uh, and I also just wanna thank everyone for joining and doing this um, really difficult thinking that we're engaged in on this topic. We, uh, Jeff and I were in a session this morning uh, for IS2 that also was grappling with these issues of addressing health equity in yeah. science uh, and very robust discussions there going on yeah. as well. I also just, just want to share one extra thought that, that really came home to me in, in this session. 
and especially this this notion about hey you know there are times where we should try to speed up and then there are other times where we should try to slow down to fully understand more context and and perspectives and and I just wonder how much of a clash that we might have with some of these ideas about how to do this better with our funding mechanisms that that we have now um, and how they, they push us towards doing certain things and how hard it might be to try to write a grant in a mechanism um, to do some of some of that work, but it just wouldn't be adequate or, or it just might not fit. And I just wonder about the landscape of funders and mechanisms and how we can do better or how to advocate for mechanisms that would allow us to change how we want to try to do this in ways that we can actually do it as opposed to fight some of these constraints that we have, which is not built at all around trying to do what we've all been trying to talk about today. <laughs> I mean, it just hit me like a mm -hmm. lead on my head like 10 minutes ago and I've been trying to recover, mm -hmm. but, but um, I don't know. Yeah, so one Thoughts thing- about that panel? I mean, one, one thing that uh, we tried to do at RAND for a little bit. So at RAND, there's this thing called bid and proposal time where you get a little bit of money to write grants like from the front office. And then the, we came up with sort of CBPR bid and proposal. So it was basically, you got a little bit of funding to just go hang out in communities and, yeah. and you know, and talk to people. And, 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 you know, the idea was that you eventually you would submit a grant, but it was at least some funding that no one else would give you to try to, uh, you know, to get grounded, you know, in that. So it could be something that like large scale organizations could carve out and make mm -hmm. available to researchers to allow them to be better grounded. But it's a great point, Jeff. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. there is definitely a clash. Well, hopefully that motivates all of you to go out and keep doing this uh, amazing work as hard as it is, uh, it's absolutely necessary um, until there are no disparities in the world. So we do have a bit of a, a, bit of a journey ahead of us. Um, but I wanna thank our panelists so much for your time, your attention, your genius, brilliance and resources and um, uh, just providing this incredible workshop to our implementation mm. science community. So thank you all so much. Thank you to our audience for your fantastic engagement. And let's just keep, keep going. Let's continue the conversation wherever and whenever we can. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. Bye.